Hello and welcome to Good Morning UK Have Your Say, a Force for Goods mid-morning show coming to you live from our nerve centre here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow with me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. Welcome to the 40th show in the series, Good Morning UK Have Your Say, broadcasting week upon week upon week. Good morning to you all and on TikTok as well. Uh, Please come in there. We're going to be here on TikTok also for the next hour. And we are knocking out the park on TikTok. This week, we reached, we got over 500 new followers on TikTok in the course of 12 hours or at the weekend there. The incredibly good work that we're doing on TikTok, reaching out, reaching out to our fellow Brits from north to south, from east to west, speaking about the importance of our great United Kingdom. This is quite an important show because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be laying out our theme for, yes, you guessed it, COP. 26 because it's coming literally to town the circus is coming to town and it's going to be arriving on halloween night which seems as we always say quite appropriate and that'll be sunday evening the circus the 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 climate change clown world circus is coming to town in glasgow and it's really just a little bit away from our office here so we'll be we'll be taking note of it and we'll be entering and joining the conversation as much as we possibly can. And we begin today by announcing what our theme for the two weeks is going to be. And before I tell you it exactly, what I'm going to do is just give you some background into all of this sort of thing. And as Paul says, of course, China, Russia and India are not coming And they're the three biggest industrialising nations which are not actually going to be at it. As you know, we take a very sceptical approach to the whole climate change clown world. And uh, it's very much something that the elites love because, as we explained last week, it's a nebulous abstract concept that they can wax lyrical about while messing up the lives of the rest of us. It's not really something that's uh, that's coming from the grassroots. It's very much a top-down imposed agenda. And it's also an anti-Scottish agenda, if you want to be specific about it, and certainly an anti-British agenda as well. Because what's Scotland good at? Scotland's good at oil. Scotland's good at gas. Scotland's good at meat creation. All these things the cops people want to get rid of. So isn't it remarkable that we have people elected to the Scottish Parliament who actually want to destroy the industries that Scotland's good at, such as our oil and gas industry and also our agricultural industry? So it's a really anti-Scottish agenda that's going on here, and that's never called out. Well, we're calling it out, as we always do. In that regard, somebody who really, really summed it up very well was the... the, uh, the broadcaster Andrew Neil, and I'm just going to read out a couple of paragraphs here of an article that he wrote in the uh, Daily Mail back on the 9th of October, which really just shows the how farcical, how farcical the cops thing is, and also how farcical is the British and Scottish administrations. Um, attempts to try to make it look like this is going to be job creation because it's not going to be job creation it's anything but that Andrew Neil points out here he says plentiful gas supplies could have been secured at a reasonable price if the government had proceeded to exploit the massive reserves of shale gas on which Britain sits but two years ago after almost a decade of failure and running scared of powerful environmental lobbies it turned its back on fracking. And I remember that and I thought that's just such a tragedy. A process of getting gas out of the ground which has ended America's dependence on Middle East fossil fuels and turned it into a net exporter of energy. 
In his speech to the Tory conference, Johnston talked of the raw deal northern towns such as Blackpool suffer because of the way our economy is configured. But that part of the North West has some of the biggest shale gas reserves in Europe. Fracking would have brought thousands of well-paid jobs to Blackpool and many other parts of the North, and we would add, of course, Scotland, as well as securing cheap gas supplies. Potentially, it could have even made the United Kingdom energy independent. But Neil continues... But the government preferred to burnish its green credentials and turned its back on fracking. As a result, instead of raising the living standards of people in places such as Blackpool, it stuffs billions of pounds into the pockets of despots from Moscow to the Gulf who sell us gas we can't do without at increasingly extravagant prices. That's not what most of us understand by levelling up. And isn't that so true you know johnson will say well we're we're uh, cutting our british carbon emissions but we still need gas so where do we get it from we have to import it from putin and through that uh, gas pipeline that he can shut off the gas whenever he wants you know britain could totally reduce its carbon footprint to zero all we have to do is make sure we export all our industry to other countries and just import stuff you know and people talk about how britain has succeeded inverted commas in reducing its carbon footprint a lot of that is because our industry has gone our industry has gone and it's gone to other countries it's gone to china especially and we import from them so the whole thing is just a, a farce basically it's a farce And instead of creating a country, a nation that is energy independent, we become dependent upon very often people who don't have our best interests at heart. And that's not good leadership. That's very bad leadership. And um, that's where we that's where we are stuck at. And we're not knocking uh, the the, uh, Boris per se, because goodness me, Keir Starmer would be just as bad and Nicholas Sturgeon and Patrick Harvey are a thousand times worse. So it's it's a problem with the political elite as such, not necessarily a party political problem. Because and as Andrew Neil continues here, he says, the zero carbon economy destroy, can destroy more jobs than it creates. One consequence of a decade of greenery is that our industrial energy costs are now twice that of our European competitors. Heavy industry from steel to chemicals is struggling to compete. The jobs in jeopardy are in the north. It's another setback for levelling up. They are... A major way we have cut emissions has been via the loss of manufacturing to other countries with plants belching out pollution whose output, output we then import. It hardly makes for a greener planet. That's what I was just that's what I was just saying there, that we're outsourcing all our industry and thereby reducing our carbon footprint. But we still need all these products which we then have to import from the rest of the world. So beware when people say that, oh we've cut we've cut our our carbon footprint. Yeah, because we've cut our industry right down and we're making it struggle. And of course, when we have to import gas, the costs for our industry also increase. So what's the answer? The answer is actually um, to 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 get back to uh, to to have a mixture of fossil fuels and not to treat fossil fuel as if it is the enemy of all humanity, because it's not. We can have a we can have a mixed energy base with fossil fuels and with renewables to an extent that it's sensible to use them. And of course, there's also the the nuclear option as well, which um, can also be added into the mix. But going completely anti-fossil fuel is just going to be very bad for our industry, for our jobs, and especially for the national grid, which does depend upon it, as well as, of course, our own heating systems in our own houses. And this is where our message is going to come in, 
because we're against this idea of everybody having to rip out their their gas boilers and replace them with a very expensive heat pumps, which don't work so well, which don't work so well. Heat pumps, the present technology of heat pumps does very little else other than just, just take the chill off the room. It doesn't create a room that's nice and toasty in the way that gas central heating does. Bring back proper industry. And another thing that we don't like about the the, the people who advocate for this, the, the COP26 elite, is the alarmism, the absolute alarmism that they promote. And that's... Um, that was really brought home to us in an article written by an SNP person called Michael Russell in The National on the 23rd of October. Now, we read The National so that you don't have to. And let me tell you, you do need a strong stomach to read The National because the, the amount of idiocy in words on there just really does, it, it really does test. It does test you. Uh, so... Anyway, this person who, is he still an MSP, Michael Russell? I don't know. I don't know. But he still gets to tell us. He still gets to give us the misfortune of his opinion. We have to think of the climate crisis as being like a sci-fi movie, right? Which is really basically where these people's heads are. Completely in science fiction. Because there isn't a climate crisis, okay? We're not all going to drown not in our lifetimes, not even in our grandchildren's lifetimes. Because as we've always said, even if the sea le le levels did rise, people have got the, the, the sense to move a little bit higher. So there's no danger from, from drowning. <laughs> the whole idea is just complete mentalism. Complete mentalism. Anyway, here's what Michael Russell says, right? And this really struck home to us. He goes... He's going on about sea levels rising. Absolute, complete nonsense again. Sea levels are... Uh, it's not an issue. It's not an issue. They're rising so minimally that it's not, at the end of the day, going to drown a single person. However, what he is particularly concerned about is that within his lifetime, it means, quote, the access to my house in Argyll will be underwater at some stage in the foreseeable future. Well, do you know what, Michael? That clinches it for me. The access to your house is going to be underwater. Do you know what? I'm, I'm convinced now. We've got to make sure that, that your access to your house is not underwater, Michael. We've really got to ensure that. What can we all do to make sure that you can get into your front door without getting your socks wet? Okay, what could we do for you, Michael, to ensure the access to your house is not underwater? Could we maybe have a, a like hire a little man in a rowing boat, okay, who could sit on the pavement and when people want to get into your house, he could like row them across maybe for for a little fee, you know, 20 pence or something like that, row across to, to Michael Russell's front door, you know, pay the ferryman to row people to your front door. Is that what we should maybe do? Put up a wee sign saying like access to Michael Russell's front door, uh, rowboat here from... 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., 12 to 2 on a Sunday. Do you know what I mean? Access to Michael Russell's front door. He actually says it. It means that the access to my house will be underwater at some stage in the foreseeable future. Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Hysterical alarmist psychosis. That's what that is. Psychosis. And he goes on and he goes, you know, we need to be part of the solution to ensure that he doesn't get his socks wet when he's trying to tramp over to his, his front door. And he goes, so we must, quote, start to live with the reality of threat uppermost in our minds. Now, that's a politician who's saying that the way to go forward in life is to live with the reality of threat uppermost in your lives. That is mental illness, okay? You don't go through life worrying about something that's going to happen. 
in your mind in the foreseeable future because you saw it in a sci-fi movie. You don't go through life worrying about those sorts of things. Um, and if you're a politician, you don't teach the people to go through life fearful and upset and worried and frightened. But people like Michael Russell want to do that to you and to our children. So we need to tell him really where to go. And we need to tell him um, if he's worried about access to his house, then maybe he should build his pavement a wee bit higher or something like that. Or maybe you should just move house, okay? Because human beings have been known to do that before. So just, oh. And then, of course, he goes on and he goes on. And and then here's something which we'll also mention as well, which is big for these climate crisis uh, clowns, is that they talk about how there's going to be massive, listen to this, forced migration forced migration now that's a clever term because it says it's not like people just migrating because they want to it's because they're forced to and also the term migration rather than immigration okay migration when we think of migration we think of like migrating swallows okay who fly somewhere for the summer and then go back again for the winter Migration suggests people going and then coming back, okay? It's not as threatening a term as immigration, which suggests people coming and never going back, okay? So the, the, the elite, the political elite, use this term migration because it's not as threatening to the human mind as the term immigration. And rather than saying mass immigration, they use this forced migration term, and, well, who's forcing these people to migrate? Well, of course, it's us. We're forcing them to migrate because we didn't change our gas boilers, okay? We didn't spend £20,000 on a new heat pump to take the chill off the room. So, ultimately, it's our fault that these people are forced to migrate by us. Okay, so whenever you see a politician using that phrase, forced migration, you also know they're completely full of it, full of it. And you know that they actually want it because there is a strange kind of attitude among certain people, especially among the SNP and the Greens, who actually want more immigration for whatever reasons. Okay, usually psycho, sexual, psycho, racial reasons, but they want more immigration into their country. It gives them a thrill for some reason. And um, Sturgeon has actually said that she wants it. She, she wants, Sturgeon wants to substantially increase number of refugees UK will settle, okay? So whatever the number at the moment, it's never going to be good enough for these people. It's never going to be good enough. They want more and more. And um, also Boris Johnson as well. He's not, he's not doing the work that he should be doing down at the English Channel either. So um, these are things that could be sorted, okay? We could sort our borders, okay? And we could keep our gas boilers. So our phrase, our phrase for the COPS 26 event is going to be control our borders, not our boilers. Okay? Control borders, not boilers. Control the borders, not our boilers. And that's going to be a good phrase. We're going to get a big banner made of that and we're going to tout it all around town and the elite can deal with that, okay? They can deal with that because that brings it home. It brings it out of the ether, literally out of the atmosphere, and it makes it something that's a real thing that people are affected by. People are affected by the fact that we're all going to have to pay thousands of pounds very shortly for new gas boilers. And for those of us who don't have to pay out of our own pocket, we will have to pay for the subsidies via taxes. 
okay so we're all gonna have to pay for to we're all gonna have to pay to become colder actually okay think about that we're all gonna have to pay to become colder why so that michael russell's front door doesn't get flooded okay well michael take your front door and chuck it in the sea as far as i'm concerned take your front door grab a paddle and swim out to the paddle out to the nearest desert island okay i hear rock halls lovely this time of year <laughs> oh man oh man yeah now we're never gonna let michael russell forget that he tried to scare us all into destroying our industry because he was worried that the access to his house might be underwater in the foreseeable future. We're never going to let him forget that, okay? Because that's just the height of politicians' selfishness, okay? We need, we need to accept, quote-unquote, forced migration into Scotland. Otherwise, uh, even if Michael Russell's house gets flooded, he'll still want that. He'll still want that. So... And of course, one day we hear about building new houses and then they build them on floodplains and complain about flooding, says Stephen. And Lisa says they're building on green spaces in Cardiff. They're building absolutely everywhere. And we see it here in Glasgow as well. And you know what their house, what these flats are for as well. It's for the burgeoning population. And I don't mean the babies that are being born. I mean the people that are just basically rowing across the channel. Um... And Margaret points out, we don't need any more immigration. We cannot get a doctor's appointment. We're told we can't go to A&E. We cannot get an ambulance. And it's a very good point. The extent to which the British uh, population overall has increased by millions in the, in the last couple of decades. And that's all coming from abroad. And the National Health Service was never created to deal with those numbers. You know, back in the 80s and 90s, it worked pretty well before these massive numbers started to inflate. And of course, of course, that causes problems for your, your NHS. The NHS was not created to deal with an ever-increasing population rising at such a fast rate. Of course, it was never intended to. Again, it's an issue that, that the politicians don't want to talk about, but they ought to talk about it. Now... Yes, on this day in British history. And I was just thinking the other day, we've got so much that we unionists love all our Scottish and British history. And we put out uh, a good post a couple of days ago about um, the, the Thin Red Line. And there was a few Scottish nationalists came on there and they just were not appreciating it. And it really made us realize the extent to which so many Scottish nationalists, you know, they either, they, the, the, if it didn't happen in the late 1200s or in the early 1300s, they really don't want to know about their own history. They'd rather ignore it. And if they can't ignore it, then they'll resent it. And if they resent it enough, they'll actually fight against it. And so that's something that I've really noticed. The Scottish nationalists only have a couple of periods of history that they are interested in. One is the whole Robert the Bruce William Wallace period that ended with Bannockburn in 1314. And the other, where they may make an appearance, is the Jacobites at Culloden in 1746. But anything outside of that, they don't want to know. They're not interested. They ignore it. And sometimes, as I say, they'll actually resent it or they'll say something retarded in an attempt to deal with it or they will actually fight it in the way that some of Glasgow City Council, SNP councillors, are fighting the statues in Edinburgh because they don't like those particular Scotsmen for various political reasons, you know. They're really, they, the, the Scottish nationalists, true believers, don't have the love of Scottish and British history that we unionists have because we embrace it all and we love it all. The good, the bad, and 
the ugly. But let's talk about something really good this morning. I want to talk about the visionary who created books like these. Remember these? You still get them. Ladybird books. That's a couple here that we've got in the office. A couple that were reissued for the 50th anniversary editions. And the visionary was a man called Douglas Keen, K-E-E-N. And the reason I'm mentioning him today is because he was born. He was born on this day, but little did he know when he was just a babe in arms that he would go on to become one of the most influential educators, not just in British history, but in the world. Because as many of us know, many of us learned to read from this man's creations. So it was on this day on the 27th of October that he was born in 1913, the visionary behind the success of the Lady Bird books. And he was born in Cheltenham. And his books opened up the world of learning to millions of children. And basically, uh, it, it was in 1938, he had joined this uh, company called Wills and Hepworth in Loughborough. And paper shortages meant that they wanted to keep their books small and concise. And we've always liked that approach to history. Keep it small and concise. Give us the facts. Give us what we need to know. And if we're interested any further, then we'll look into it a bit more. But we also, not just did we learn to read from his books, but we also developed our love of history from his short factual books many of which he illustrated um, himself and sometimes wrote as well. Um, books on nature, books on history. Um, and his idea was eventually, quote, eventually we were able to say that whatever the subject, there was a ladybird book that would help with the homework. And that's so true. That's so true. Um, and not only that, but it actually his books actually got also taken seriously by by the Ministry of Defence, who ordered a shipment of several hundred copies of the computer, how it works, to introduce its employees to higher technology. And the Ministry of Defence also bought copies of Understanding Maps to provide to give to British soldiers during the Falklands War. And uh, Thames Valley Police bought how it works the motor car to train its own police officers. So um, lots of people learning from Lady Bird books and Douglas Keane was the visionary behind it and he became the editorial director and he passed away at the age of 95 back in 2008. So, a man that's contributed immeasurable, immeasurably to making the world a better place. And, of course, a great Briton. Yeah, good to see everybody. Please do uh, give us a share um, if you're on Facebook and on Twitter and uh, on YouTube and on TikTok as well. And give us a follow on TikTok, please, folks, because... We're really knocking it out of the park on TikTok. And we're reaching a lot of people on TikTok that we don't normally reach. One of our videos last week on TikTok reached 151,000 people. 151,000 people, one of our videos on TikTok last week. Incredible. Incredible stuff. Paul McDonald talking about books there. He goes, Alistair MacLean, the novelist, was a Scot, yes, I believe he was also from Glasgow, I think. R.D. Lane, famous doctor, was a Glaswegian. Uh, Richard puts a unionist spin on history. He goes, the wars of independence and the Jacobite rebellions were exciting periods of history, but the sequel is that we got together and changed and blessed the world, and that makes everything more exciting and he got a lot of history ladybird history books in 
his childhood as well. Cool. Now, today there's going to be a budget by Rishi Sunak, okay? And it's been mooted that one of the things that he's going to suggest, and time will tell, is that he's going to offer direct spending to uh, various councils if they want it in Scotland. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, as we know, before devolution, the entire infrastructure of Scotland was created by direct spending from the British Treasury. It went to uh, basically the Secretary of State for Scotland said, let's, let's build a bridge. How much money do we need? Several million. Let's have the money. Let's organise the troops on the ground to build the bridge. Very simple. No middleman. Nothing like that. And the entire infrastructure that we live in today, with the exception of the, the Queen's Ferry Bridge, with the exception of that, everything else basically was built pre-devolution, which is to say pre-1999. And it was built well, and it's still with us. All the motorways, all the new towns. Imagine that, new towns were built. I mean before devolution. Could you imagine the SNP these days being tasked to build one house? Okay? Yet they built entire new towns. Five new towns were built pre-devolution. Everything was built pre-devolution by the simple method of the money coming directly to Scotland from the British Treasury. But somehow that was too complicated. And so they had to really mess things up by putting a middleman in called the Scottish Parliament, which was established in 1999. And all that does is ensure that the people in, in uh, Holyrood are tasked with seeing what a mess they can make of whatever project they're given to do. OK, so it really slowed things down and it complicated things and it made it a lot harder for things to get done. But hey, that's what people voted for and that's what we're stuck with. However, time has gone on and people have seen, well, you know what? There's roads that need to be repaired. There's housing shortages in the Highlands. There's a terrible drug toll which is being taken among many people in Scotland. These are issues that the Scottish administration can't sort out. How could, and but councils would like to sort them out but they don't have the money, so how could they do it? And of course the answer is maybe we could go back to how it used to work where you got the money from directly from the British Treasury and the council took the money and did the good work with it. Um, an old idea, but one that uh, works very well. So there is a rumour that Rishi Sunak is going to announce that he's going to what's called spend directly or direct spending. He's going to uh, have a have a well we'll just have to see how he's going to do it but there's going to be money that's going to be available for councils if they want to get money directly from the British Treasury to sort out the issues that the Scottish Parliament's never going to get round to bothering about and if it did ever get round to bothering about it it would just mess it up anyway so that's uh, that's that's quite exciting news because that's something that we have long advocated for and in our we book for the union which i suggest that you do get a copy of if you've not already it's only a fiver we'll put the link up there just please do uh check this out in the back of this we have 23 policies to strengthen the united kingdom and one of those was simply direct spending for the united direct spending from the united kingdom parliament to the councils and it doesn't have to just be to the councils it can be directly into our pockets for example the furlough scheme the self-employed income support scheme those schemes that ran during the the last 18 months that's direct spending from the british treasury directly into your pocket very often so that can be done it can be directly spent with councils or it can be directly spent into your pocket, or it can be spent via systems of grants for particular things. For example, if you want to train up students 
um, for, for something like that. You can have a UK nursing grant that people in Scotland can be eligible for. Um, there's lots of ways of getting money directly from the British Treasury into the hands of people in Scotland. And we need more of that. We need more of that so people can see the value of the United Kingdom. Because if they're not aware of where the money comes from, people will just imagine it comes from the SNP. And this is a real, this is a big issue. So if you're going to direct spend, you've also got to properly brand so that people know where the money is coming from. Because funding methods are so convoluted in Scotland that very few people can figure it out without sitting down and trying to work it all out. And how many of us have got the time to do that? So if you're going to direct spend, you have to properly brand. And not only that, but you have to do a third thing, and that's take ownership of it. Because this was brought home to me back in Six years ago in 2015, the British government launched something called the City Deals Scheme. And this was a system of payments directly from the British Treasury to cities and areas throughout the United Kingdom, including Scotland. Huge amounts of money to regenerate these areas. Now, when the scheme was launched in Scotland, it was launched in Greenock and it was launched by the SNP. It was SNP ministers who took the lead on it. And it made it look to me and to everybody else who was looking in that is this some kind of SNP scheme? Is the money coming? Where's the money coming from? You had to read the small print to realize that the money's actually coming from the British Treasury. And these SNP imposters are trying to pretend it's their money. And this is what the SNP do. If you give the SNP administration money, they will take it without thanks they will bank it and then they will pretend that they never received it and if they even acknowledge it at all they'll say that it's not enough or they'll pretend that it was theirs all along for some reason so you have to just not include them okay you have to go over their heads because they will take your money and they will misrepresent it as their own largesse, as if it's coming from them. So it's good to see moves being made, hopefully today, in the budget for direct spending. But Rishi, Rishi if you're watching this, remember, you've got to properly brand it, and then you've got to take ownership of it from beginning to end, okay? And if you don't have enough ministers or enough people to properly take ownership of it, then you're going to need to recruit some to the Scottish office so that they can be taking ownership of your projects and leading with it so people know where the money is coming from. And what I've just said to you, what I've just said to you, we are going, we've, we've, we've written already in our 40-page magazine, which is coming out at the end of November. It's called Do More Together, and it's a 40-page special edition magazine, which is going to be dealing with lots and lots of policies and how to enact them properly in order to help the United Kingdom stay together. And of course, the theme is Do More Together, because when we do more together, that's how we bond. And uh, that magazine will be free to union supporters. That's people who donate five pounds or more a month and we'll put the union supporters link up there otherwise it's going to be uh we'll, 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 we'll have to sell it but if you're a union supporter you can request a copy free of charge and lisa marie says labor do the same in wales london give them money and they pretend it's from them yeah yeah that's a serious serious issue and it 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 uh, suggests that the British government, whoever they may be, do not have the do not have the, the the levers on the ground and the people on the ground to properly brand and take ownership and move these projects forward. And it may be that devolution has essentially killed off the the British footprint, the British government footprint in Wales and Scotland, or um, is it hitherto. So that footprint, as they say, needs to come back because otherwise the, the British angle 
will be forgotten about or misrepresented. Catherine says she's going to try to share this to Rishi. Thank you. <clears throat> Kenny wonders if uh, he hasn't seen any polls for a while. And is that because the SNP know that they're struggling? Yes. Well, do you know, the, the SNP have their own pollster in the shape of Angus Robertson, who uh, who's a... Is he an MSP or an MP? I don't follow their careers very much, but he's something like that. And um, I think he's an MSP. Yes, he's an MSP for Central Edinburgh. And he runs his own polling company. Can you believe that? He runs his own polling company and then he releases polls about showing 110% of people think the SNP is doing a great job. And the, the Scottish media go, oh, very interesting poll. Yes, well, 110% of people think the SNP is doing a good job, says Angus Robertson. MSP for Glasgow Central for the SNP, who also runs his own polling company that also took this poll. And, you know, it gets reported seriously. Kathleen says, great program today. Very informative. I'll have to watch it again. Fantastic. Stephen says, everything the SNP touched has been a catastrophe. It's fail after fail. Um... Now, Tommy says something. How many were at the march at the weekend? Now, I'm not... Uh, the march at the weekend. I'm not sure what one... That was. There was one two or three weeks ago, and there was what, three, four, six, I believe we counted. 346. Um, but talking about marches, and, and thank, thank you for reminding me of this. There's going to be a march on the 6th of November through Glasgow. Now, initially, we had been looking at this and we thought, is this some sort of Scottish nationalist march? Because AUOB was broadcasting it as if it was going to be their Scottish nationalist march. And so we thought, OK, well, if they're having a Scottish nationalist march, we might look into whether we should be there or not. And then we got some more information about it. And cheeky we people you know what they've gone and done is they're not having a march there's something being organized that day by something called the climate coalition and auob is going to tag along in it or at the end of it pretending that it's actually a scottish nationalist march when it's not at all it's a march about climate change okay so this is something to watch out on the 6th of november AUOB is going to try to misrepresent the climate change march as a march for Scottish independence when it's not. It's a march for this climate change cops thing with AUOB people, maybe two or three hundred AUOB people who will actually be in the march. So it's not a Scottish nationalist march. It's a climate change march. That's on the 6th of November, Saturday, the 6th of November. And um, so... Be aware of that. Now, unfortunately, the media is bumming this up big style, okay? The Telegraph is talking about 100,000 being there. I read in the Daily Mail yesterday somebody talking about 150,000 being there. That is all just utter nonsense. And I'll tell you why it's nonsense, okay? The march is going from Kelvin Grove Park along down West George Street, around Nelson Mandela Place, along the top of George Square, out to the high street. Now, to negotiate that little curve that goes round the church there at Nelson Mandela Place, okay, there'll be about 100 people will be able to pass that in a minute, okay? And that's just physical fact. You can't get people round that little curve faster than that okay so that's a hundred people a minute so if there's going to be a, a hundred thousand people on the march that march will take a thousand minutes okay now a thousand minutes is almost 17 hours okay so let's say the start of the march comes round there at noon the end of the march won't come round until 5 a.m the next morning now, we all know that's just nonsense. We all know it's going to be nothing like that. Nothing like that at all. All right? Yet, yeah, we've got serious newspapers bumming this up to these kind of ridiculous figures. 
you know, it's like the media don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. They can't even just work out basic physics. So please, folk, be conscious of this. There's no one near that number of people in Scotland who care. The number of people in Glasgow who care about even the climate change thing and who would be prepared to go on a march, minuscule, very small numbers, okay? You'll get some people in Nicola Sturgeon's constituency, the students in Nicola Sturgeon's constituency, and you'll get a few kind of ageing liberals in Hindland and the West End, and that's it, okay? Working class Glasgow doesn't care about climate change. It's a it's a concern of largely students and, and a certain middle class element. And of course, the ruling elite, they all care about it. But beyond that, nobody else is caring about it. OK, so you're not going to get numbers like that. You might have a decent sized march of people who are concerned about the climate, but it's going to be nowhere near the figures that the media are saying. But I, I don't think they'll ever in Glasgow's history have been a march of 100,000. The numbers are absolutely crazy. And we this is a big thing of ours because we we uh, we count the Scottish nationalists when they march and we stand up for the truth. On that page there, we detail all the Scottish Nationalist marches that we've counted when this was published at the start of the year. And, for example, when All Under Banner, All Under One Banner said they had 80,000 back on the 11th of January last year, we counted them at 10,156. When the SNP themselves said that the Scottish Nationalists had a quarter of a million in Edinburgh in October 2019, we counted them at 11,286. So these are the sensible numbers that these marches actually come in at. They don't come in at anything with, um, you know, with uh, six numerals in them, or even five half the time. Well, six numerals. They don't come in with six numerals. That's just absurd. Well... Derek says you should tag along at the back of the march. Well, if some some people who are, who are unionists who care about climate change are certainly welcome to do that if they want. A force for good won't be doing that, but we will be um, we will be touting our banner around, which will say "Control the borders, not our boilers." That's going to be our theme for the two weeks of the event, which begins on Halloween and ends on the 12th of November. It says that would make a good letter to the Telegraph, Alistair. Yeah, good point. Good point. Maybe we will send in a letter, especially if they start with us funny numbers. Then if we see the funny numbers mentioned again, we'll... we'll, we'll we will send in a letter to whatever newspaper is men mentioning these funny numbers. Linda says, why don't all the green SNP people go to China and America to shout about climate? Sick of hearing it. Perhaps getting the NHS education and services fixed would be better. Shops are closing and there's drug addicts here. All they clear, care about is the climate. God save the Queen. Please say hi to me. Hi to God save the Queen 01. Good stuff. Glad to have you on. Glad to have you on. If you're on TikTok, please give us a follow. Please give us a follow. Now, anything that I need to say that I haven't said today. I really wanted to put that... I really wanted to lay down a marker, though, for this mar so-called march that's coming. It's not going to be anywhere near the numbers that the media are bumming it up to be. Uh, the, very irresponsibly. And, because if those sorts of numbers were coming into Glasgow... Um, that's just going to panic the police. It's going to panic everybody. So, you know, you need to keep a, a, a straight head on you when you're when you're uh, writing for the media. And bumming up figures like that is just absolutely ridiculous. And it's not going to be a Scottish nationalist march. We have discovered the Scottish nationalists are simply hitching a ride on the back of a bigger march, but pretending it's somehow a Scottish independence march which they shouldn't be doing that, you know, they shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be misrepresenting things in that way. 
and they're not they're not being clear with their supporters about that either. They need to be clear about that. Anyway, folks, thank you very much. We have got. Um, please do. Please do check out our wee book for the union, and if you can see a way to help us, uh, please do. Please do as well. So, folks, it's been a blast. We'll be back next Wednesday with this. We'll be back on TikTok and Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. So in the meantime, let me just say God bless the United Kingdom and God save the Queen. See you next week. <laughs>